Well, I think you're really going to love this program. I've got Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, uh, a specialist uh, around our heart. I've got Dr. Dan, who, as you all know, uh, with our Acid Doctor uh, program, is a, a big uh, sort of cut down carbs like I am and, and, and eat saturated fats to get healthy. Uh, we both come from both being technically obese in the past to hopefully looking a bit better right now. Um, <laughs> and. Um, we have Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, who the first book I ever read of his was The Great Cholesterol Con, which I thought was amazing. That's why there's a few quotes in my first book. Then wrote a book called Doctrine Data, which is about how doctors can, mis well, not doctors, but uh, researchers can uh, manipulate data to actually get the end result that they want. Hence, lots of things that we think about food are wrong and things that we are told we shouldn't eat, we should eat, and things that we should eat, we don't eat because we're told not to. Um, and then your latest book, uh, which is just about to come out, which is absolutely fantastic, uh, focuses on a topic which is very, very close to many of us, uh, which is statins. Um, are statins good for us or not good for us? Or do they actually, uh, you know, what's the answer? We'll find out in the next half an hour. But I want to start off with, uh, back to your first one, the great cholesterol con. My dad, sadly, uh, earlier this year, got diagnosed with diabetes. But before he found out, and he, he was feeling really, really rough for, for a few months, uh, we sent off his blood results, and my doctor phoned me up. She said, Steve, you've got to get your dad in. He's got too low cholesterol. Now, I thought there was no such thing as too low cholesterol. It was always about, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know too high cholesterol is the bad thing. Tell me, tell me why, because uh, yeah, I know I've done a lot of research now, but tell everybody why too low cholesterol is actually a lot, lot worse. Yeah. Uh, well, the only thing that surprises me about this story was that they were worried about his cholesterol being too low, because nowadays it seems everyone's quite happy for your cholesterol to be low and even lower and lower than that, and let's get it to zero virtually. So. <laughs> So I'm quite gratified that somebody was worried about a low cholesterol level. A low cholesterol level, I mean, there's two ways of looking at it. I don't believe cholesterol causes heart disease. I don't believe a low cholesterol level is in as of itself damaging, but it is a sign that things might be, they might have a problem, mm -hmm. right? So people who have very low cholesterol level can be found to have underlying diseases that are lowering it, and they can be quite serious. Unfortunately, one of them is, and I don't know if this happened, is is having quite a late stage cancer mm -hmm. or liver disease. Mm -hmm. Diseases like this can lower your cholesterol level. But also, a lot of research has shown, especially as people get older, the lower your cholesterol level is, the more you are at risk of an early death. Yeah, I know, I read that yeah. a couple of years ago. And it's in the first book I wrote, that it's bizarre, isn't it? It's the opposite to what people think. It is the opposite. There are there's a couple of conditions. There's chronic kidney disease, which is quite a common problem in the elderly, whereby they have this thing they call reverse causality. So in that condition, a high cholesterol is protective, and a low cholesterol means you're more likely to die. And the older you get, the, the, and not having any of this, these diseases, the higher your cholesterol level is, the longer you will live. <laughs> This is a fact, and um, so also... So if that's a fact, let's have that one more time, because right. that's important. Say that one more All time. Right. As you get older, yep. the, the higher your cholesterol mm -hmm. level is, the longer you will live. Amazing. Also, people with lower cholesterol levels are more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, and other neurodegenerative diseases. Wow. So when you're about 50, 40, 50, 30, 40, 50, 60, your cholesterol level is not that important one way or the other. But if it starts to drop or it's very low, that's quite a serious health sign. And I would take it seriously, although the rest of the medical profession seems to say, fantastic, it's zero. You'll live for, oh, sorry, you've just died. But isn't um, the, the brain's fuel, and that's why I guess. Well, uh, fuel, well, the, well, the, no, no, well 25% of the dry weight of the brain is cholesterol. and. If you so don't a quarter of the weight of a dry yeah, brain is cholesterol. cholesterol. And it also is the brain manufactures its own cholesterol because it's vital for the, for the functioning of neurons. It is also what makes its synapses, which is what makes memories. And if your cholesterol level starts to drop, it's not surprising that your brain isn't going to function as well. Um, so cholesterol is a critical substance for, for neuron nerve cell function and growth and the, 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 what they call the sheaths, a thing called a myelin sheath that surrounds neurons, which is vo vital to their function and growth. That is one of the highest cholesterol-containing 
tissues or substances in your body. Fascinating. What happens when somebody comes into uh, to you as a doctor, Dan, and, and says, oh, I'm worried about my cholesterol, is it too high, too low? I mean, it sounds like lots of doctors are confused. How do, you, how do we deal I, with this? I do think a lot of doctors are confused about this stuff. I think, you know, it's ever likely that patients are confused about this kind of thing because, you know, we talk about cholesterol, um, but actually what we're very often talking about with regards to cholesterol is actually what we call lipoproteins, which are really the vehicle which cholesterol is transferred around the body uh, along with fat and certain vitamins and, and other things, which is, is how cholesterol gets out to the body. So, mm -hmm. so, but it seems to be that we talk about cholesterol and lipoproteins as the same thing and many people watching will have heard of low density lipoproteins or LDL, which is so-called bad cholesterol yeah. and HDL, high density lipoproteins, so-called good cholesterol. Um, but really, you know, I think a lot of people are very confused about this. Then we add triglycerides into the mix and total cholesterol. You know, it's, it seems to be... Very, very low dense VLDLs. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. And so, and, there's, yeah. and, and to be honest, there's also intermediate density life proteins as well. So, you know, it's no wonder people are getting confused about this kind of stuff. And actually, um, I'm, I'm not surprised. I actually think quite a lot of doctors are confused about this kind of stuff. But my experience is that, that a lot of people, you know, are afraid, afraid. They've heard a lot of things about statins mm -hmm. and a lot of it is quite correct to be concerned about really. The, you know, every medication we give, we have to really balance up the risks versus the side effects or the adverse events, the bad things that can happen. Mm -hmm. And statins, certainly not without their fair share of bad things that can happen and so often we are we're, we're taught that they're sold they're sold as this great thing that just reduces heart attacks uh, and is going to help you live longer but you know as the conversations we've been having today it's not necessarily the case and actually the data has been presented to us in a very different way from you know how how it actually is in reality when we start to think about it in terms of, you know, because what we what we really want when we're taking these tablets is, you know, is this is this going to help me live longer? Yes. And I know you've yeah. you got some thoughts about oh, yeah, how yeah. the data's manipulated. Yeah, I tell you what, when my, when my cholesterol was high, um, when I was stressed about business, um, it was pitched to me, and I've had the same uh, doctor I go to for annual medical every every year in London since I was. 32, 33, so we adore each other, we're getting really, really, really well. But it was pitched to me in the way that if you don't get that cholesterol down, I'm going to put you on statins for the rest of your life, and that's the only way you're going to live longer. And then we're talking about actually, even if statins were to do their job based on looking at this research, that research, whatever, we're talking about adding a couple of days. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. you can't know, you take this drug every day that makes these companies absolutely hugely rich yeah. and, and very profitable, but you might, even if it's not about, because there is some belief that it, it's not. Although it brings down cholesterol, it might be a different effect the statin's having that gives it its small claims yeah. and it might extend life. But even if it extends life, we're only talking about a minuscule amount across everybody. And therefore, let's look at the other things first, like stopping smoking, cutting diabetes, getting a bit more exercise, getting some sunshine yeah. and so on and so forth that could have much bigger effects. Well, there's evidence from a number of studies showing that when people take a statin or take other any medication they kind of think well that's me done you know I'm safe and in fact then people take less exercise do less other things to benefit their health so I think there is a definite that is a factor which you've also got to take into consideration you know I've, oh, I've just had a, a high fat meal I'll just take a statin I'll be all right I mean, obviously that wouldn't be my argument but that is how people do think about these yeah. things and as you say the data are presented as I've seen studies saying if you take a statin, it will reduce your risk of a heart attack by 36%, which sounds fantastic and wonderful. When you start stripping that down to its basics, what you find is, a bit like the Wizard of Oz, there's a little man <laughs> hiding behind the curtain. The, the little man hiding behind the curtain is, even if you're at high risk, if you take a statin for five years, in the best possible clinical trial that has ever been done, you might get an extra 4.1 days of life extension. I, I question these figures, but these are the figures. So even when it's presented with the truthful figures there, the benefits are really vanishingly small. Yeah. And you think... And, and of course, there could be an adverse effect as well. Well, I, I believe that... I mean, if you talk about quality of life, 
a thing called the quality of life is the thing that NICE uses yeah. to measure, you know, the, the quality, the, the quality adjusted life year um, is, is the thing that they measure, measure medications and interventions on. All you need to do is to reduce your quality of life by less than 1% and it would wipe out any any life extension benefit mm. yeah. as they measure these yeah. things. Yeah. So it's really, and, and the number of people that I see, and you'll have seen this too, mm. they're coming going, oh, you know, I've got muscle pains and muscle aches, and quite often doctors will say, well, it's better than dying of a heart attack, isn't it? Mm. Well, it is better than dying of a heart attack, but it's not better than increasing my life expectancy by a few days and spending the rest of my life having my quality of life knocked on the head. and seriously damaged in many cases. I've yeah. seen people's life. I had a woman who came to me just before Christmas and she'd had really severe stomach pains and such that she'd, she'd had a laparotomy, she'd been opened up. They couldn't find anything wrong. They stitched her up again. They were going to do further investigative operations. I said, stop the statin. And seven days later, all of her pains had gone. Wow. So someone telling me statins don't That's cause terrifying. adverse effects, all right? That's terrifying. I, I've seen, and I, according to the statistics, I should, I should have seen maybe, maybe I should have seen one patient ever who's had a condition called rhabdomyolysis, which is where your muscles break down. And they break down, the, 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 the breakdown products arrive in your kidneys, your kidneys fail, and you die in many cases. Rhabdomyolysis. I've seen 10 people who've suffered rhabdomyolysis, and that's supposed to affect one in 10,000 people. So that she means I so should, have seen should have seen a million, a million people, people to yeah. have seen that many yeah. people. It's usually something that would occur after a, a marathon, yes. uh, something significant where you've you've literally broken down yeah. a significant amount of your muscle mass, yeah. and those breakdown products are essentially killing off your kidneys and yeah. can put you into intensive care. Yeah. But it's yeah, it, it yeah. does happen with statins. So I'm going to ask you a question. I, I hope this goes the right way. Yeah. Uh, the great classical con. You're a GP. You must measure all sorts of things with lots of different patients coming yeah. in. You must have had lots of customer, uh, patients over the years that have had high cholesterol. How many of you put on statins? None. None. Well, that says a lot. That says a lot to me. Somebody's got... Um, I'd, I'd, I'd re-question re re slightly by saying a lot of patients come to me who are already on them yeah. or they've had a heart attack and been put on them. Yeah. So I suppose the secondary question is how many people have you taken off statins? And Dr. Martin Kendrick, yes, how many people. patients have you taken off statins? I like to say I've never taken anyone off statins. All I've done is presented what I think is the benefits and the potential harms, yeah. and I have left the decision entirely up to them. And a number of people have stopped their statins, and many have come back and said, you know, I really just feel so much better. Yeah. I just, I can't describe how I feel. The problem is that a number of the adverse effects are the same as getting old. Mm -hmm. So your muscles ache, you're a bit more tired, you're a bit more forgetful. You know, the, the commonest problems like this are we've got a bit of indigestion. And then, and they are dismissed as, oh, you're just getting old. And then, but then you say, well, we'll stop them, you know. And I had a guy, he's a really bright guy, and he said he just couldn't do Sudoku anymore. Yeah. And he, I didn't know why, so otherwise he was fine. Stopped taking the statins and suddenly he could do Sudoku again. Mm. Because this... The, the problem you have is, of course, as, as your capacity, as you get older and your capacity reduces, yep. you can reach a point of crisis with, with quite a small drop. I mean, if you're, you know, Albert Einstein and your yep. IQ drops three points, you probably wouldn't notice. Yep. But if you're just about coping and just about remembering where you put the teacup and whatever, then you are in a, you know, you just drop that down and suddenly, yep. bang. So I've seen people who have gone from, uh, in fact, I saw a lady who was, we, we were doing a capacity assessment to get lasting power of attorney. Her family were about to put her in a nursing home. We stopped the statins, and she literally got out of the bed and walked again, and it turned That's into. Uh, when you when you've seen that happen to somebody, yeah, you think, don't tell me statins can't cause problems. The only thing that amazes me is that people don't get more problems with them. Yeah, I can't. I think you must have a constitution of an ox to put all this stuff. <laughs> um, but, and, and some people yeah. do 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 fine, and then they're not on any problem. But a lot of people. But then people fool themselves yeah. about whether drugs help them or not. So I mean, let's just go back one little step. So sadly, if you've got cancer, you've got cancer, and you've got to take the right medication, the right treatment to remove the chronic illness. Here, what we're talking about with statins and heart disease is 
people are measuring cholesterol and there are some people because of certain research that have said cholesterol increases your chance of having a heart attack and therefore if that is true then here's this medication that can lower cholesterol although it might have some side effects but what we're actually saying is we don't think it's cholesterol in fact Dr. Mark Kemp says far stronger than I do, but we don't think it's cholesterol that's causing heart attack. There's lots of other reasons we're going to talk about in a minute that what you can do to, to really get your, your chances of having a heart attack right, 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 right down and diminish your chances. But it, cholesterol's, you know, cholesterol's good. It's got a bad rap because of all this research, but the brain needs it. You know, there are cells in the body that need it and so on and so forth. So let's go to, we'll come into a minute about what you can do to reduce your chances of having a heart attack without taking statins. Uh, why do people believe, or how did all that research come about that said it's high cholesterol that causes heart attacks? <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> oh, he's coughing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you take this one, Malcolm, that's your risk. So don't, don't worry about that, by the way, guys. Yeah, yeah, we can yeah, cut yeah, that yeah, bit right, with, right, with right. a cough, because <coughs> we're, both, we're both super healthy. So okay. I'll just say it again, then we okay. can cut to it. So why do people associate high cholesterol with the cause of heart attacks? It's been going on for many, many years, um, and we take it back to you know, times when um, it was observed that kind of a fatty-like substance was observed in the, in the walls of arteries, which was thought and was proved to be cholesterol, and therefore people you know, started to get these ideas about cholesterol being the, the thing that's causing heart disease. And you know, a number of kind of, I think, very probably well-intentioned studies oh, in, yeah. in animals and that, which were, you know, well, what happens if we feed a rabbit cholesterol? Well, uh, are these, these plaques gonna get better or worse? And, they, and actually, of course, a, a rabbit, which isn't really meant to have cholesterol in its diet, will get worse plaques when you feed it cholesterol. And, uh, and that idea has morphed on and, and in the 1950s and 60s, when there was this perceived rate of high disease, heart mm -hmm. disease in America, um, we get people like Ansel Keys coming into the mix who um, started equating saturated fat with rises in cholesterol and therefore, uh, and then we ended up with the, the dietary guidance which showed that, that was, was I think heavily influenced by industry, I think it was the United Department of Agriculture well, well, as yeah, well. Well, you've got to remember it was, um, the, the report was written up by a vegan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? That is true. Yeah. Um, so, US Department of Agriculture <laughs> were heavily, you know, involved in those. You know, and obviously yeah, they've yeah. got an agenda to be, you know, trying to sell more grain and mm -hmm. protecting their uh, their mm. interests that way. So we end up with very high carbohydrate, low saturated, particularly low saturated fat diets, yeah. and yeah. and that's one of the big reasons we're in the mess. This mess. Yes, and and research that. Um, was, was basically um, uh, one of the, my favorite stories at the moment is there was a big study done called the Minnesota Coronary Experiment 1968 to 73. This is before guidelines were written where they got people to stop eating saturated fat and eat polyunsaturated fat, mm -hmm. uh, which they did, and their cholesterol levels fell by about 15% or something of that order uh, on average. And then what they found was that um, those whose cholesterol levels fell the most were the most at risk of dying of heart disease. Now, that's an interesting finding. The most interesting thing about this study was it was never published. It was hidden away and it was in, found in the garage of one of the sons of one of the investigators. But the other interesting thing about that study is, have a guess who was the lead investigator on that study. I know this one. It was uh, Ansel Keys. Uh, oh, really? It was Ansel Keys. Yes. Funny that he uh, buried another bit well, of his research. Yeah. yeah, well, he did research to try and prove the case that polyunsaturated fats were healthy. Mm. He found the exact opposite and then did not publish the data. Thankfully, it's been republished recently, yeah. re gone back over. And it's, it really? Yes, well, it, was, it's it was discovered. There was a group of researchers, there was a study called the, um, the Sydney Heart Study, mm -hmm. which was slightly earlier where they had published some of the data but not other parts of the data. And these researchers managed to find all the data and found that actually the same thing. They, they increased polyunsaturated fat, heart disease rate went up and death rate went up. That part was not published. Mm. They said, oh, the cholesterol level fell, how wonderful. And the, but the Minnesota one, 
then somebody said, wasn't there another study done? Wasn't, am, I, am I imagining somebody else did a study? And they went and found the data in the garage of one of the sons, and wow. they got it all out on all these, I don't know how they read it, it must have been on tapes or something, <laughs> and they got it back and they found these results. Wow. And, and this was prior to the guidelines being written. There was no evidence to support the guidelines when they were written, but had this research been available, the only research that had been done would have been negative and contradictory, mm. and it was never published. So this is why when you say, where's the evidence? I say, well, I know where the evidence come from, but I call it the Bing Crosby School of Research. Yep. You've got to accent the positive, accentuate the positive, be, uh, you know, yep. what's the other word? Refuse the negative, you know. Essentially, that's what happened. Anything that was positive, trumpeted to the rooftops. Anything that was negative was buried, not mentioned, and gone. So how can you, you have a, you have a research, it's a bit like, as we said, about tossing the coins. If every time you toss a coin 20 times and you said, look, it came up heads every time. Said, no, it, no, it came up tails just as often. Oh, no, we don't. We, we don't, don't, care, we don't care about those <laughs> tails. They don't care. It's only the heads we're looking at. Yeah. That's what they did. Yeah. And they, again, they did research on antidepressants. SSRIs the, is what they call serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And this was found after the event when they when they went to the high court and when they went to the supreme court in america and forced them to reveal the data that had been the exact figures are 34 studies on ssris 16 positive all published 14 negative none published oh. two equivocal not published so you have a, a database on evidence which is if only the positive is published and the negative is not everything's going to look positive yes that's not how you do research yeah that's how you fool people. Yeah. That's how you destroy the health of nations. Yeah. And and this should be these sort of people. They, they should end up, in my opinion, they should end up in jail. Yeah. It's a bit like staffing companies are like uh, the emperor's new clothing. Yeah. Go away and do all this research, but don't come back and tell me anything that doesn't support my argument. Yes. Mm. Yes. Is what yes. we're saying is happening. Yes. That, that is that <coughs> is what's happening. The first statin studies was the thing called the American Air Force coronary something prevention study, AFCAPs, TEXCAPs, it, it was coming back negative. It was basically just stopped and they said, yeah. they then said it, this was not a, a trial on reducing cholesterol and heart disease. Yeah. And they didn't produce the data. When the data were looked at again, yeah. they found that actually the people on the statins had a greatly increased risk of heart disease. Yeah. And that data was just not published and got rid of. Yeah. And there was one study on statins done that was not done by the pharmaceutical industry, one large study it was called All Hat, American Lipid and Something Hypertension Something Study. And in that study, they gave people pravastatin. The cholesterol was lowered. There was no impact on heart disease, none. And that's the only study which has shown no impact on heart disease. And it's the only one that was not done by a pharmaceutical company. That's amazing. Go figure. Yeah. You know? So the only one not actually undertaken by the pharmaceutical companies is the one that showed it wasn't having an effect on yes heart attacks. So it might lower cholesterol, but if it's not cholesterol that's causing heart attacks, then why lower something that actually, you know, uh, that you don't need to lower and that might have a side effect. But we're not here just to bash statins. What we're no, here to work out... Yeah. It's a good <laughs> idea. Well, it, it's well good. we have a chance. Yeah. Uh, it's a good idea because there's lots of companies making loads of money out of something that has side, negative side effects and really, uh, you know, I was almost on them. Um, so for me, that would have been quite frightening because it might have increased my life expectancy by just a couple of days if it is true which we don't believe it is. Um, but then I'd be taking something that isn't natural and we're trying to live primarily. We're saying, look, there has to be a primal way to live a healthier happier, longer life. And that's trying to think that's in keeping with the body. And what I was so delighted talking to you earlier today about was that actually the things to prevent heart attacks are all the things that we keep talking about yeah. primal, aren't they? Yeah, the, the, the common themes that seem to recur every time we yep. sit down to have a chat in these, these seats here. Yep. Yes. You know, exercise, good diet, avoiding the sugars yep. that is gonna you know, send you down the, the path towards diabetes. Yep. Um, stress, yeah. increasing social interaction as a way of yeah. you know, building up uh, you know, your resilience to stress, yeah. um, sleep, all yeah. these kind of good things that yeah. you know, really form the backbone of what we're talking about. Yeah. And yes. sunshine, you said. Yeah. Yeah, has well, a, sunshine yeah. is absolutely beneficial, yes. I think that, I mean, these are not really new discoveries, are they? Uh, in part, the problem, I think, comes from 
how do you make money out of it? I mean, I'd like to, I'd, I'd, I'd like to have something to sell and say, buy this and it'll promote it. I don't have such a thing. Yeah. I don't believe there is such a thing. Yeah. Um, there may be one or two supplements, there may be some vitamins. Uh, I mean, I think if you went out, did all these things, exercised, pushed around, had lots of friends, ate really the best food stuff you could find naturally that came to you from the surrounding environment, environment you probably wouldn't need to take anything else, really. Yeah. Oh, alcohol in moderation. Alcohol in moderation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, but of course, uh, unfortunately, our our the soil and the nutrients are becoming depleted mm. in the soil, mm. um, and and we do sometimes lack some things. I think the, the problem is in knowing which ones you're lacking. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting concept. Potassium, as I've talked about, magnesium is an increasing issue mm. for a lot of people these things are becoming depleted in the soil and are becoming depleted in our foodstuffs. Should we all go around checking every single level of every single mineral in our body? It's difficult to recommend that. I mean, yeah. what you say is eat as good as sort of natural food as you can, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these are the things that, 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 yes, that we should be doing and encouraging, but we focus so much on, and I, and I see it myself, elderly people, every people, taking a tablet is, is seen as a, it's just a good thing to do. And of course, ironically, there's studies showing that if you do take tablets religiously every day, it is beneficial to your health, even if they're placebo. Yeah. And even if you're told they're a placebo, they're beneficial to your health. Yes. So actually doing something, <laughs> That's crazy. So you don't need to say to someone, this is a placebo, that you don't need to say, this isn't a placebo. Yeah. You can say to them, this is a placebo. Yeah. I want you to take it every single day. Yeah. And it's as beneficial as if, you thought you were taking an active drug. That's mm. the research that's been mm. found. That's it's, sta staggering. It, it, it's staggering because people want to do things to help their health or just do something. It, it seems to be helpful to do something, just to do anything almost, mm. yeah. so long as you keep doing it and then it's beneficial. So when you look at a lot of studies and they say, oh, adherence to statins is beneficial, I say, yes, adherence to picking your nose 14 times a day would be beneficial if someone told you, pick your nose 14 times a day. Mm. It would be beneficial. And this, 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 the trouble is Western medicine has, has, has said there's the mind and there's the body. And the two things are separated here maybe or about here. Yeah. And they have no other connection whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And having a healthy mind and having a healthy body is just nonsense. Well, it's not nonsense. It's absolutely critical to your yeah. health. It is the most important thing. In the book I've written, the single thing that has been found that, that, that very good book that everyone needs to buy a copy for everyone at Christmas, next Christmas, <laughs> it's not out till the 27th, is the single thing that reduces your life expectancy more than anything else is mental illness. People who are severely mentally ill, and you're talking about schizophrenia, but even severe depression, average decrease in life expectancy is 15 to 22 years. Mm. This is massive. Yeah, that's a, a statin might give you four days, five days. We're talking here decades off your life expectancy. This thing here, if this goes wrong, yes, there are other things people who are mentally ill take more drugs and smoke and do other unhealthy behaviors, but take all that out. If you're not mentally, I say to people, health is three things. It's physical, it's psychological, and it's and it's social. Social. It's three and so it's kind of three pillars of doctors yes. saying always keeps telling yes. us. Yeah. Three pillars that I got taught on my very first day at medical yes. school. Really? Is, yeah, every disease has a biological, psychological and social component. Yes. And it's we all kind of laughed at it because you at the you well, know, it the very beginning of, yeah. it sounds all very woo woo yeah. and, yeah. and all this kind of stuff. And actually, you know, I wanted to be a surgeon back on my first day at medical yeah, you, school and I wanted to cut medicine, things yeah. up and take things out. Yeah. That's proper medicine. But actually <laughs> the further I go into it, yeah. every consultation, unless you can find out the biological, psychological, and social components, yeah. you can't treat illness properly. No. Yeah, and you know, no. my annual medical with Dr. Rene that I've, like, I've had since my early 30s, we spend the first half hour every time. So we have sort of an hour and a half in total. First half hour, I didn't realize about 10 years ago why she was asking me this. It's, how's your family? How's mm. this? What are you doing? Yeah. What hobbies are you doing? You're still playing your football? You're still doing this? Mm. And, uh, and they were all around the social side. And yes. I could never work out at the beginning why she asked yeah. all those things. Yes. Well, here's a waste of another half an hour. Because she was just being nice. Oh, she was yeah. just being nice. But it's <laughs> yeah. important, isn't it? If you've got a good, if you're having a nice social time and yeah. you're interrupting your family and friends and going to church or doing something and getting yes. out and meeting yes. people. Yes. When you, you know, we had this big debate, didn't we? Because if you don't know, I, I wrote a lot about don't go running because it's not good for your knees. Long term, it's just going to set off free radicals 
bottles, it's not good for you. Mm. And then in the second edition of the book, I had to calm that down a bit, because Dan said he wouldn't work me if I didn't, because he said, <laughs> you've got to still say, go and do the park run on a Saturday mm. morning, because A, it's not a long, long run, yeah. but also it's so social, and you're so out social, in the fresh yeah. air. Yes, and, yes. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what? There's every, every Saturday when I go and do a park run in Coventry, there's an elderly gentleman who, who comes out and he's a volunteer. He's not running it, but it's a real key point of social interaction for people yeah. that's beyond the exercise. Mm -hmm. And that's why one of the reasons I'm such a big fan. I'm so glad you included it in the book. Oh, well, Thank there you. you go. So, look, <coughs> I've got a GP or two GPs, one that's... Uh, got a, a new business coming called uh, Carb Dodging, one that's an expert uh, in the heart, and we're, and we're all, I think, saying that it's not really cholesterol that's the problem. In fact, Dr. Michael says it's not the problem. But listen to what we're saying can prevent heart disease. First one, get out and meet people, socialise. If, if, you, if, you, if you're home alone, try and get out, try and get somebody to come in and see you, but, but try and uh, get your social uh, circles uh, going. Avoid stress. Avoid mental illness. Yeah. I suppose. That can be difficult illness. for some people. I mean, some people it's a biochemical genetic yeah. problem. But, um, but you know, the the latest risk factor calculator that's come out in the UK called Q Risk Three, as now includes severe mental illness, use of anti uh, atypical antipsychotics as a form of medication itself, and yeah. and it's it's in a recognition that these things are are I mean incredibly important, really important and they need to be taken seriously. And loneliness, for instance, we know that's a disaster for people now. Yeah. Mm. So it, it really, yes, I just want to reinforce that even more. Really. Yeah. Yeah. And while um, you know, avoiding stress can be difficult, try and seek some help, but also some great books. I read a book, uh, I've been away the f last few days, uh, by Norman Vincent, who, uh, a really old book, I think it was written sort of 60, 70 years ago. Um, and it's all around just thinking about you know, not taking yourself too seriously and how, you know. Uh, but even many of the things that he talks about in his book, he's a very religious man, was about that social interaction as well. So, um, and just go out for a walk, you know, we, we, a little bit of exercise when, when things are mounting up on top of ourselves and remembering yeah. the good things in life, even when you know, tragedy strikes and, uh, and traumas happen in our lives, getting outside, getting a bit of exercise, you know, interacting maybe, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying, sitting here saying everyone's got to go to church, but just getting people around you and do stuff is, is fantastic. Yeah. Um, out in the sunshine we've talked about um, cutting down the carbs. Um, let's go back to one thing, uh, let's go back, let's go, we, we, We've given you a few things, but let's go back a little bit technical. Um, we have different pathways. You were teaching me earlier on today uh, that um, that it's only really, really the arteries where we can get this buildup of plaque, uh, and that, that it doesn't happen in the veins because of the the different pressure. Let's just go back into a bit of detail about what does actually, without going too complicated, what causes a heart attack. Um, and I think by putting a bit of colour into a bit of flesh on the bones here, we might be able to then also help people to understand why it really isn't LDL that's causing the yeah. problem. Well, I think the heart attack or the stroke itself is, I'm in agreement with the mainstream, if you like, the final event yeah. is, is, is reasonably well established, although it's more complicated than we're given to understand sometimes. So you, you've got the artery, the blood's flowing through it. It's, it's being narrowed by the buildup of a plaque. Now, eventually, sometimes what happens is that. Okay, just stop you for one second, because yeah. I, I, you know, I've just written a few thoughts yeah. on this. I've still got it wrong. The plaque to start off with isn't on the inside of the artery. It's actually in the wall. It's in the wall. Off. Yes, it's not on the. It's not on the. It's, it's not sitting on the artery wall, protruding in. Yeah. In fact, if you pressurise the artery up post mortem, it, actually the artery maintains its its um, roundness. Um, and pushes the plaque backwards right, until okay. a very late stage in which it starts to intrude. Yep. So quite often you may see the arteries looks a bit narrower, but you mm -hmm. won't see like a lump on the side of it or anything. Yep. However, that point can become a, uh, a vulnerable point, if you like. And so the, the, the terminology is that the cap of the plaque erodes, some stuff escapes into the bloodstream and that the bloodstream goes, oh, we're bleeding and immediately forms a very large clot right on that point. Yep. Blocks the artery completely, yep. and that's when you have a heart attack. Yep. And sometimes you can't find a, an actual blood clot there when you look whether it means it's been got rid of and has moved away from that point. But this, the stroke is slightly different because the stroke, the artery's in the base of the neck here. You'll get the plaque build up and a, and a, and a, and a clot will form, 
but it doesn't block the artery at this point. What tends to happen is it breaks off, travels into the brain, finds a narrow artery and blocks there. Right. So it's so slightly different. Well, it's, the, the basic process is similar, but the, mm. the actual final event is it, it doesn't block the artery yeah. here, it blocks that. So where artery it actually brain. formed isn't where it caused the problem. No. It formed no. in a bigger yeah. artery, but then traveled into a smaller vein where it now does that, that cause just, it, yeah. And then it just blocks at yeah. that point. Yeah. Um, so you, you know, to an extent, that's, um, it's the same underlying process, but the, the final event. I mean, you can block arteries elsewhere in your body. You can block an artery into your kidneys, you can block an artery into your bowel, you can block an artery going down into your leg. So you can get blockages elsewhere, but the commonest ones are the heart and the brain. So that's the final event, that's the blood clot forming. So you can say, what can you do to stop that happening? Well, stop blood clots forming. <laughs> yep. I mean, stress will cause blood clots to form. Um, Dehydration. Why, why, why is it? We keep talking about stress in so yeah, many yeah, yeah, different yeah, yeah, illnesses. Yeah. What is the correlation between stress and the blood clot forming? Well, there's two. So we'll go to the, the acute event is when you're stressed, you're in a fight or flight situation mm -hmm. and your blood becomes more ready to blood to clot. Because right. it thinks you're going to be attacked by a It thinks you're going to be attacked by a bear or, or something, yeah, so, it doesn't yeah. want to eat, so it's ready to clot. Right. So your blood becomes more clotty. Right. And so when you're in a more clotty situation, obviously a clot's more likely to form. Yeah. That's why Monday morning is the commonest time to die of a heart attack. Really? There's actually yeah, graphs well, there's 50 times more likely, of the week? Yeah, you're 50% wow. more likely to die on a Monday morning than a Wednesday afternoon. What, first day back at work or...? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, in the morning, your cortisol level, which is a stress hormone, peaks up. So yep. at about six o'clock in the morning, your cortisol is at its peak, so you're ready to get up and go. Yep. And that's when you're most likely to go, have a heart attack or stroke. The evidence, and in fact, in, uh, they've looked at research of when there's been earthquakes or in countries, there's quite a peak of deaths from heart disease mm -hmm. for the next few days. Yep. And in fact, they did a research in France when they won the World Cup in 1998, the rate of heart disease dropped for the week afterwards. So there's an acute effect, Amazing. if you like, all right? Yeah. And also, if you go out and shovel snow from your drive, this is one that happens in America and Canada, you go out and shovel snow in the cold, so when you're cold, your blood becomes more clotty and sticky, and then you're shoveling and your stress hormones goes up, and then, so that's quite a common way mm -hmm. of having a heart attack okay. is that sudden stress. So, so that's, that's that, 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 I think that, 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 yeah. that was really interesting to get across because yeah. we've all talked about stress and heart attacks, yeah. but it's that stress is that, uh, and, and short stresses are okay because it, it's on and off oh, yeah, quickly, yeah. but what you're saying is that prolonged stress is we're in fight or flight for so long and um, because uh, uh, the body thinks I've got to get the blood prepared yeah. to stop any cuts from yeah. you know, bleeding the clot up is what causes a lot That's of clots. That's the acute thing, if you yeah. like. But also, okay. lo longer term chronic stress also because the stress hormones, which are essentially the adrenaline and cortisol and noradrenaline and glucagon, they're directly antagonistic to insulin. Right. Okay, okay, so now we're getting the link now so, to diabetes. So if you've got prolonged stress, yeah. say mental stress, depression, and things, yeah. in fact, people with diabetes, a number of them, if you've got sorry, people with depression, if you've got severe depression, you can develop diabetes. <laughs> you can become diabetic in depression. Wow. And then when the depression goes, the diabetes goes, because the insulin is now working, whereas previously it was being blocked by, yeah. by cortisol. So, and once you've got that happening to you, um, you've got raised blood sugar levels, you've got raised insulin levels, you've got continuously raised clotting factors, because the yeah. chronic raise in clotting factors is there as well. So you've got a, if you like, a smorgasbord, 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 <laughs> of things that will be damaging your artery, making your blood more likely to clot, and generally just being a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So all of these things work together, if you like, um, to create a pro-thrombotic, which is more likely to clot, also damaging to the artery yep. situation. So it all works together. So the acute event, if you like, can just be a continuation of the chronic event, or just an acute point of the chronic event. So this idea of suddenly dying under stress you know, the Sherlock Holmes thing. They did a study called the Hound of the Baskersville Effect, where they looked at um, the number four in, uh, in uh, Asian countries is unlucky. And they found that more people die on the fourth day of the month in, Ch in Asian countries than any other day. They just die mm -hmm. on that day. Because they were stressed about it. Stressed that about day. that unlucky day. It's yeah. a bad day. And of course, the, course the more you start out. to believe it, it's self-fulfilled. Well, of course. Well, that's why they called yeah. it the Hound of the Baskersville <coughs> yeah. Effect, was yeah. the guy died of fright yeah. because he thought yeah. the hound was coming for him or there was yeah. no hound or whatever. Yeah. I can't remember how the story goes, but yeah. anyway, he died of fear itself. It yeah. killed him. Mm -hmm. and, and you can die of being frightened. Yeah. You can die of stress. You can die of excitement. I mean, yeah. extreme excitement can do it for you. Yeah. 
you know, the body is... So, uh, did that answer your question? <laughs> no, that really, really did. No, that really did. The question again was, you know, why... We all know that stress causes lots of problems. What's the relationship between stress and heart, heart attacks? And it is that that fight or flight builds yes. up uh, the clock because that's what the, the blood's trying to do in the body at the time. Uh, okay, so if it's not cholesterol that's causing the problem, we now know one of the reasons yeah. causes clots. I'll just step you back at this point. Mm -hmm. There was a study done in America in the 50s where they looked at accountants at different times of the year. Now they file accountants twice a year in the States. Mm -hmm. I think it's April and August or something. Anyway, they looked at the cholesterol level of accountants during the year and what they found is at the times of high stress their cholesterol levels went up 50% and then dropped back down again. So there is an argument to be made, and I have made it, that stress causes heart disease, stress causes your cholesterol level to go up, and therefore it's an association, it's the stress that's causing both things. But people have said it's the cholesterol that causes the heart disease. This is the old argument of if people with yellow fingers are more likely to get lung cancer. Why is this? Because they smoke, and their smoking causes the yellow fingers and the lung cancer. So stress causes your cholesterol level to be higher and it causes the heart disease. So in my opinion, cholesterol are the yellow fingers of the epidemiological world. That's a great way of saying it, yeah. Right. Yeah. Anyway. So stress we've got to try and avoid. Um, smoking, we, we, we talked about uh, in mm. another session, uh, is, is, is another uh, cause. Uh, of, of heart failure. Uh, what other things are the causes, and then let's get on to some of the positive stuff about what we can do to um, to prevent. Well, I think there's several things that we just can't do anything about, and I think pretty much the the biggest cause of heart disease that we haven't talked about is age. Mm -hmm. Okay, and as we age, we we don't repair things as well in our bodies, and we, you know, Malcolm talked about the Q risk calculator, which is one of the computer computery things that we do to calculate someone's risk of dying within the next 10 years yeah um, you know whether that's accurate or not is down for debate but um, but actually one of the key things that you can play around with on this is is the things that you can't play around with in your life the fact that you are aging and actually your age as a 30 year old man as an age as a 60 year old man will significantly cause an increase in your heart disease so yep. you know we can't get away from that can I, can I ask a question about this specifically though about age when somebody has a heart attack is it how often is it the actual pump 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 the heart that goes or how many times is it the blockage or is it always the blockage or the, uh, the, the you know or both as so when the pump when the the actual pump stops pumping as well yeah that that would be really what we call heart failure and it'd be a progressive um, slowing of, you know it usually happens over months and years mm -hmm. uh, and you know you get symptoms throughout the body you know collection of fluid where fluid shouldn't be occurring that's really heart failure where the pumps failing yeah now that can happen for several reasons and a heart attack can cause that because it yep. can cause the, a weakening of the muscle yep. uh, it, and actually a heart attack can be one of the things that brings on heart failure but actually in terms of a heart attack you know it's predominantly this clot yep. forming blocking the artery and how then does aging affect heart attacks is it something to do with so we've got the plaque we've got the clot yeah. and we, we have the ability to remove clots is it, is it that we have ability to remove the clots as we younger and self heal better than as we age and as we age we can't remove the clots right. or I think it's a combination of things I think um, essentially what I would agree with is that the plaque grows up gradually in in your arteries quite how fast it grows and quite how much that that is irreversible or reversible to a degree it's reversible. So as you get older, you're gonna have more and more of these things. Yep. So essentially, you're just gonna have more plaques developing. Yep. I think that um, that's the primary reason. Obviously, as you get older, your repair systems are not so good. So therefore, any damage that occurs is less likely to be repaired easily, and therefore more likely to be damaging. So I think it's a combination of things, but of course, people can reach extreme old age without having any mm -hmm. problems with their heart. Um, a 72-year-old man that I'd been speaking to was of interest because his LDL, which is his bad cholesterol level, was 18. Wow. All right. And wow. he'd written to me saying, I've got an LDL of 18 and I don't have heart disease. And I went, mm, fine, well, people write me stuff all the time. But then he was actually written up as a case history in one of the journals. A man of 72, his LDL level is 
six times as high as normal. He has no discernible atherosclerotic plaque anywhere in his body. Mm. It's right. almost like it's not related. It's like oh, it's not related. Oh, funny that. Yeah. <laughs> there's a, there's a well, good book about that. There's several good books about that. But you can say, so he's doing, I mean, what, uh, ironically, he said, what's protecting him against his high cholesterol level? So <laughs> nothing's protecting him against his high cholesterol level because it doesn't cause heart disease. Um, but it was interesting that you can find people who have nothing. Yep. Now, th what does that mean? That means they must be doing all these other things right. So I think, going back to your point, which is correct, if you use the risk calculator, the Q, the Q risk calculator, by the time you reach 60, as a man, your risk will have reached 10% of having a cardiovascular event in the next 10 years, that's how they define it, at which point you're recommended going on a statin. So if you have no other risk factors at all, if everything else is perfect, you set them all to optimal, don't worry, I've done it, and you just put age 60, yep. it's 10% and you should be on a statin. In America, the risk at 7.5% is on a statin. So every American over the age of 55. So you can be absolutely <coughs> healthy, have yes. no other yes. illnesses or pointers or indicators in your test at all. Yes. But no. just because you're 60 years old, you could be the health, you should go jogging every day or whatever, you mm. know, or the park running once a week and you're eating, all the things we tell you to eat. But just the fact that you're now 60 years old, they, go, they recommend statin. And even, that's even if your cholesterol is normal. Yes. Well, that's no other risk factor. That, that means nothing else. Mm. You can set your blood pressure to 90, so not, which yeah. you can do, actually, which is yeah. weird. Uh, you can set your no family history, no diabetes, nothing, nothing, right? All right? Mm. It's all perfect. You say, well, how, how has the heart disease happened then? You know, yeah. seeing as you've got nothing to cause it to happen. Yeah. And I think reading yeah. the blue zones where people live into their hundreds, yeah. most of those people don't take any drugs whatsoever. Well, of course they don't, yes. Yeah. yes, yes. So, um, so this is a nonsense. Well, it, well it, of course it's nonsense. It's, 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 you know, it's beyond a nonsense. I mean, I asked the question, which is, well, women are less likely to get heart, disease, mm. heart attacks than men at a younger age, say under 65, or pick your age because everyone does studies at different ages. So you can set all your risk factors the same on the risk calculator and change your sex. And it will, if, you're, if you change it from female to male, it'll double it. If you change it from male to female, it'll halve it, mm. right? And you say, well, why do women have less heart disease than men when all the other factors are the same? Mm -hmm. There is no answer to this question. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, there's just no answer to the question. That's it. So what you're saying is half the population in the world is protected against heart disease for reasons that we don't even understand. Mm. Yeah. And then you say, you do the family history one is, if you put in, I've had a family history, if somebody, one of my first degree relatives had a heart attack before the age of 60, I think that doubles your risk. I think it might be 70%. Mm. And then we go, so all the other risk factors are the same, and you've got a family history of heart disease. So how, how is it causing heart disease? Through what factor is this yeah. happening? So there must be something else yep. that we haven't identified. Yep. So men versus women, you know, family history, ethnicity, you move yep. from, Pakistan or India to Britain, your risk doubles compared to the surrounding population if all other risk factors are the same. So if you were like a Pakistani male um, uh, uh, aged whatever. 60. 60 <laughs> and, and, and you took that and you said, well, you're a female, yep. you know, um, with a whatever. Yep. You, 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 your risk would be 10 times higher. Yeah. And yet, they're unexplained. Yeah. There's nothing in the, the, the mechanism of action to explain it. Yeah, and that word cholesterol didn't come into any of those conversations. No, there's no, you, know, you, <laughs> you keep the cholesterol the same. Right. <laughs> uh, and your, your yeah. risk goes yeah. like this all over the place. I mean, cholesterol's, in fact, the least difference on your calculator is made by changing. Mm. And in fact, they don't even measure LDL on the risk calculator. Hang on. So on a risk calculator that was put out by, was it that UK? UK, uh, yeah, well, it's basically, it's a combination of all groups like nice BHF, etc. Okay, et so a really well thought through calculator yeah. of your risk of a heart attack doesn't even ask the cholesterol question. The LDL question. The LDL question. It says what's your total cholesterol and your LDL, HDL yeah, that's cholesterol. That's amazing. The and ratio. then calculates the ratio. That's what they also do in the States. So your LDL, which is the one that's supposed to cause heart disease, is not a factor on the Q risk score or the CV risk calculator in the States does not exist. Which is so really interesting because actually one of the things we, we talk about is, is the H, that HDL being lower is a marker of insulin resistance. Yeah. I wonder how that would tie in. Well, of course it ties in. Yeah. That it's does a, tie it, in. Yeah. It's a marker. It's a mar mm. I, it, 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 what we've done is we've created this, this, this sort of thing and said, yes, well, if you, these things do increase your risk. I mean, the, 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 the calculator in, in the UK includes postcode. Right, it has postcode in it. In America, it has a zip code. 
because you can find that if you live in one <coughs> county in America versus the next one next door, your risk can be twice as high. Yep. Even if all other risk factors are the same. Yep. In fact, the most accurate um, risk factor calculator on which actually predicted whether you were going to die or not of heart disease was um, was a Twitter um, account. Um, it looked at Twitter accounts in the, in the northeast of America. And if you had lots of negative comments in the Twitter <laughs> account of people in your area, you were far more likely to die of heart disease than if you had lots of less negative accounts. Oh my goodness gracious. And it's right. like little dots and it's like, this is the most accurate way of knowing if you're going to die of a heart attack, is if people in your region on Twitter are saying nasty things. That's just it's a terrible. social thing, isn't it? Social. Yeah. Yes, social. <laughs> Somebody said something to me the other day and they said, um, Comparison is the thief of joy. So, and I think that's one of the big, big problems now with the internet and social media. Mm. You know, what does all your friends post? They always friend post the happy pictures, everything mm. that looks great. They only show you the good side. And if, you, if you're a little bit depressed and you see your mates having a great time, comparison is the theft of joy. Just remember that mm. one. But let's wrap this up with, we're gonna yeah. do something I don't know if it's ever been done before <laughs> in, 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 a, in, a, in a video. <clears throat> Let's, between the three of us, so I've written several books on health, uh, was a real mess a few years ago, obviously a lot better now. Dan uh, was a GP that was also a beast, as a GP, has worked out how to get his, looks, he looks amazing right now. Um, you know, and, and you're looking great too. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I'm only overweight. We've got, three different, we've got three different decades between us, we won't say which one's which, we'll leave you to guess those. Um, so let's, between us, Two GPs and somebody that's just learnt about uh, good health. Let's between us try and say what we think the five best things that you can do to avoid a heart attack or cardiovascular diseases. Let's nail five and see if any of the three of us put taking medication is any of them. Mm -hmm. So, number one from you. Stop smoking. Let's just assume they're not smoking because yeah. that's such an obvious Aww. one. You copped out on the easy <laughs> one there. Well, let's let's just assume. If you're smoking, stop. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's have six then. That was number one, but we'll leave that for later. You just got to stop smoking. Let's uh, let's go num number number one again then. Try another one without smoking because we've got to assume that. Stress less. Stress less. Go sunbathing. Go sunbathing. I like that one. Um, I'm going to go stress as well. I'm going to go stress. I'm going to go stress. So, but we're all there. Well, I, 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 no, 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 that's okay, because I'm going to go number two and I'm yeah. going to go sunbathing. Yeah. I think every time, because I think sunbathing and stress really, I've got a bit of a tan now because I've been out in the sun mm. last week, been abroad. Um, and I just noticed, because I've been in the UK pretty much the whole month before, mm. not out in the sun at all. Mm. Um, and I just got away the other day, a bit of a business conference, but also in the afternoon, a bit of sunbathing. And you just go, shh. And I think they're related. Yeah. I think that getting out in the sun for the appropriate yes. amount of time just de-stresses you anyway. So yeah. I think those two are probably yes. very... Why not, why not exercise in the sun? Yeah, well, that's why I, I, yeah. uh, I would say to people, go for a walk in the sunshine, mm -hmm. in the countryside, looking at the trees and the plants yeah. and the flowers. Yeah. And that, you know, is just... Is just brilliant you with know. a dog if you've got one because I've then you've got, got cats the, and they you've don't, got social yeah, yeah you can't yeah, maybe not take the cat <laughs> um, but yeah so exercise mm -hmm. we're, I think we're probably all three of us are in the same three there yeah exercise son avoid the stress uh, let's let's have the next one well what have we been talking about oh so many things um, I think, you know, it comes back to diet. Diet, yeah. diet really. Yeah. I was you hoping somebody say diet. It's my, <laughs> it's my big one, really. You know, uh, for all the low-carb, higher-fat advice and stuff we give on here, I, I still think the number one thing that I would it really encourage people to do is to completely get rid of sugar in their diet. Yeah. I really would. And it's just, you know, when we look at how it breaks down within the body and how the different components, the glucose and fructose, and the way that is a powerful inducer of insulin resistance within the body, yeah. I've got to say, just, you know, you know we, do, we don't know how much sugar is safe for people. Um, yeah. It probably varies from person to person. We just don't have data about that. And actually, you know, if you had to nail me on the one thing that I think was causing the most misery, you know, in terms of, causing obesity and diabetes, yep. it would be our increase in sugar intake. And we know for fact diabetes can cause heart problems, no. so therefore <clears throat> cut the sugar. 
Uh, and for a doctor that has specialised in this area around the heart mm. for 35 years, we're talking about diet. What about salt? Tell me about salt. Well, I was going to give you a triple answer. Oh, the God. One, which is, when I first started looking at heart disease, I looked at France and said, why have they got such a low rate of heart disease? I said, because when they have meal times, they're major social occasions, everybody relaxed, they eat slowly, their stress hormones are down, and they're digesting properly. So all I said is eating when you're relaxed and eating, making eating and meals a, an important social occasion. And um, I think that, that um, we, we're, we're designed to eat and relax if you're anxious or stressed or whatever mm -hmm. and you're under pressure when you're eating, your stress hormones are up, yep. they fight against insulin, your body is in a metabolic battleground. Yep. And therefore what you need to do is to, is to make sure that meal times, apart from what you eat, how you eat, how you eat what you eat, yep. and making sure that you say, you know, ask me, do I cook? I cook. Try and sit down. When you have a meal time, have a proper meal time. Yep. Don't eat on the move. Eat when you're relaxed. Mm -hmm. So that kind of you know, brings us together. Going back to your question on salt, is salt bad for you or good for you? Salt is good for you. Have more salt. Unless there's something wrong with your kidneys, you can eat as much salt as you could possibly imagine. Mm. Your kidneys, in a 24-hour period, can get rid of 50 grams of salt. Oh. As I say to people, when you're in an intensive care unit in a hospital, they put a drip up on you. That drip will be 0.9% salt, which is 9 grams of salt. 2 litres a day, 18 grams of salt. So when you're in hospital and seriously ill, they fill you up with salt. And then when you stop being ill, they tend to the wards. I thought about that before. And then you can have a zero salt intake food. <laughs> so why is salt good for you when you're really unwell? And then it's really bad for you when you're really well. It's nonsense. It's complete nonsense. It's the most evidence-free area of medicine. It's utter nonsense. Salt is not bad for you. Mm. You couldn't eat enough salt for it to be bad for you. That's so, it's, so it's, interesting. It's almost like it's got this inbuilt-in safety mechanism, hasn't mm. it? Yeah. You know, you yeah. just, you can't, it's not like sugar where you can, you can drink a whole can a bottle, yeah. you know, yeah. and it just keep going and going and going. Yeah. You know, it's naturally you don't want to eat too much salty food. You you, took, you add too much, it's yeah. just not palatable. Yeah. Well, and, and that comes yeah. at a point way before it gets it could to be a point. Well, there, there, is, there is an argument which I've seen put forward, which is that taking salt out of food has caused obesity, because we need a certain amount of food, salt, and if we don't get enough. We will continue to eat until we get enough. Interesting. So we replace the salt with sugar. We get addicted to the sugar, yeah. and we haven't got that thing that that, that we naturally go and that is yes. enough. Mm -hmm. Back to your point a second ago on eating slowly. I remember doing an audio course with a great company called uh, Nightingale Conant a few years back, all about that eating slow. Because in New York, there's this whole thing about uh, the French live longer, don't have heart attacks because of red wine, and and, and it, they got it kind of. They admitted later that they got it wrong. The thing that they'd overlooked it wasn't the red wine that was constantly across all these people that were living longer and avoiding heart attacks. It was exactly what you just said. Mm. Social, slow eating. Yes. Enjoying the food, you know, metabolizing it properly. You eat less when you eat slower because you chew it more, you taste it more, you send all those hormones around the body yeah. that says I've eaten enough already. Yes. Whereas fast food is fatal food if you're not careful. Yes. So, yes. so we're, 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 we're on four then. We've gone sunshine, avoid the stress, um, get um, social with our friends, get out and meet people, uh, exercise and diet and sorts of case. I think we're kind of there. Did we say go and take medication and take medication for what? You, uh, people are using an indicator for, for cholesterol to say you're more likely to have heart problems when actually we don't believe that's an indicator at all. Um, get good nutrition, get exercise in. We, we touched on magnesium earlier on, things like magnesium, we just can't get enough in the diet based on the fact the soil's uh, depleted, so maybe uh, supplement magnesium, maybe supplement with uh, you know a, a good multivitamin, etc, uh, um, etc. Et but back to living more primarily, I think, it, it is, is the answer. Well, I, yes, uh, I, I think that that must be, we, we're designed to eat you know, we're living in a modern world for the last hundred years, which is very, very strange for how we were designed to live. And, and whilst many of those things are great fun and we, a lot of them are enjoyable, mm -hmm. I think we have to look at our physiology. What's it designed for? How's it yep. designed to be? Yep. How are we designed to live? Yep. And, and we need to, we need to try and because you know the, the blue zones are places where people eat. It's yep. all very clear. 
Mm -hmm. They do the things we've just been talking about. Yeah, exactly. This is what they do. Exactly. So why would we not advise anyone to do these things? You yeah. know? So do what's natural for the body. Dan, thanks for coming Thank and joining you, us Steve. on this session. Dr. Martin Kemley, that's absolutely fabulous. Thank you very, very much. And please do rush out yes, they, and the get fifth, hold fifth, of his yeah. books.